Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Ah, hello. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Thank you. you all. Love you all. Hey. Well. <laughs> well, I did a little last minute research. Oh, God. Uh, uh, <laughs> And, and can you hear me all right? It'll be all right, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I saw uh, a documentary uh, about the documentary about you. Yeah. Which is called Who is Norman Lloyd? Yes. And uh, your great friend Carl Malden was on it. And of course, this moves me since I've only been a member. Uh, here since 1958, and you were a member. You are a member since 1939. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Malden said, <laughs> Norman Lloyd uh, is the history of our industry up to now. And uh, here we are now, and we're going to go further uh, with you, and you, as always, are going to share your life, your work, your career, your vision, and your thoughts with us uh, after over a hundred, oh God, a hundred years. <laughs> so to begin with, uh, I understand that your daddy's name was Max, your father. Yeah. And, and your mother's name was Sadie. Mm -hmm. And you were born in uh, uh, New Jersey. Jersey City. I should give it the correct pronunciation. <laughs> Jersey City. Well, once uh, the people hear you uh, talk, uh, and uh, it's remarkable, and people have said, how did you learn to get rid of your Brooklyn accent? Because you did grow up, even though you were born in Jersey, you grew up in Brooklyn. I was born in Jersey, and the accent was complicated in Brooklyn. <laughs> So it was uh, like a these Joes and Dems, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it was Eva Legallion. When I was accepted into her theater as an apprentice, she used to have in her repertory company 25 boys, 25 girls who were apprentices, who walked on, carried spears, did all the extra work, no money, but in return received diction lessons and dance, and had scenes criticized by her company, scenes of the apprentices. And it was a galleon who said to me one day, <clears throat> you know, Lloyd, <laughs> if you ever hope to be a member of my company, you had better learn how to speak more properly. Because her repertory was Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, etc. And you weren't going to come in with a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> so we had teachers down there, members of the company actually, members of her company, work with us on the speech. And we were diligent about it. And she witnessed scenes, as did other members of the company, and gradually you began to be able to play the Shakespeare and the Ibsen and the so forth and speak it properly, which is called Mid-Atlantic. <laughs> it's sort of theater speech, but it's much better than naturalistic speech, if I have to say so because you are, it opens the door for you for these great plays, particularly Shakespeare. Unless you learn to speak properly, you cannot play Shakespeare, pictures or theater. So that's how I learned to speak as I do now. And excuse me, and the production of voice. We had an old-fashioned idea in those days. The audience should hear everything. 
Somehow that's changed. I'm not going to go into that now. You know that. Well, I, I, your, your son, your soul son, Michael, uh, at, told me uh, and asked me to talk with you about the WPA. And the, it, it, tell us what the WPA uh, was and, and how you participated uh, in the WPA. Thank you, Elliot. I'm delighted to speak about the WPA. Uh, the man who headed the National Theatre of England, whose name escapes me, once called the Federal Theatre the greatest theatre since the Greeks. And he was serious. This was in the 30s. And on the Federal Theatre, I got onto the Federal Theatre uh, because I was a friend of Joe Losey's, who subsequently had a very good career as a motion picture director. But Joe was directing in the theatre in those days. And uh, when I was with Le Gallion, out of Le Gallion's theatre was formed a company of apprentices who then formed their own theater, in the course of which Joe Losey, who was then a young director, and his competition was the young Orson Welles. And what happened was uh, that Joe uh, was on the WPA and got me onto the WPA to appear in a play called Triple A Plowed Under. This play was about the farmer, about his land being plowed under. And then we went to another play after that called Injunction Granted, which was the history of labor in the courts. And after that, we did another play called Power, which was the history of uh, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority. Now, as you already know, these plays were all very socially oriented. In addition to which, a very interesting thing, <clears throat> many, many, many of the audience, and we played, by the way, Broadway houses. We played the Biltmore, which is now called, I think, the Samuel Friedman, and we played the Ritz, etc., and the 48th Street Theatre, we played those theaters, and the amazing thing was that many, many of the people who came to these plays had never seen live actors on a stage. And for a top of 80 cents, I think it was, we were getting $23.87. A week. A week. <clears throat> Every two weeks we'd get it. These theaters, these audiences, were great because they talked back to us. They thought you should. <laughs> and then in, in uh, <coughs> AAA Plowed Under, <clears throat> one of the actors played Earl Browder, the head of the Communist Party in America. When he would come on and be introduced as Earl Browder, the audience would go, ah, oh, there'd be a riot in the audience. So he then went to the management of the WPA and protested that he should get more money than anybody because clearly he was the star. <laughs> because his reception was much greater than any of us poor fellows. Um, in the WPA, in addition to this great cultivation of an audience, you got a sense that the theater meant something to the people out front, as it did to you. That these plays had a meaning in the lives of these people, that they could relate to them, 
not only aesthetically, that is to say, the art of the theater. Elosi was very interesting. He had been to Russia at the time of uh, Bakhtangov, the great Russian director, who was the rival, so to speak, of Stanislavski. And he had worked and studied Bakhtangov's work, which was totally different from the method, the opposite of the method. And Losi carried that forward in his staging. The plays had an expressionistic quality, particularly <clears throat> in the settings. And so this was introduced to America at a time that had not quite seen it before. And we were very proud of the fact that we were carrying forth with a kind of foundation for the American theater that was going on. Because at the same time, as the WPA, and starting in 1931, was the formation of the group theater, which changed all acting in America and in other countries too, in England. And not only the group theater, there was the very left-wing theater down on 14th Street in the Galleons Old Theater, the Theater Union. And for those of a higher cultural level, there was the Theater Guild. And to be accepted into um, upper-class society in New York at that time, you had to have a subscription to the New York Philharmonic under Toscanini and to the Theatre Guild, which had a program which would import plays. They, they were the ones who showed you Shakespeare, uh, Bernard Shaw and Eugene O'Neill. And these were the people who came out of the Theatre Guild with wonderful actors, particularly Alfred Lunt and Len Fontaine who were magic. They were a leading theatrical couple, but I do not think we've ever had their equal since. Uh, so the WPA was also going on at the same time. And the result was a, a flood of theater in America. You had on Broadway, this was not off-Broadway, unless you were down at 14th Street in the Civic Repertory. So you had this activity, and many of these people eventually went into film. Now, I know I'm talking about theater now, but this was the beginning. And from that, you had people go into film. I want to go back further. Uh, uh, when you first became interested in this industry, in this business. You must have been a child. I know we had radio. I don't know if your parents took you to Yiddish theater or what kind of theater you'd seen, but where did you get influence? Where were you influenced? Would you like some water? Because in my family, we went to theater a lot, and I, I would go with them. And I'd see Al Jolson, I'd see Eddie Cantor, I'd see Walter Houston. I'd see Leslie Howard, I'd see stars, Bankhead, and so on and so forth. We had stars in the theater then. <laughs> I refrain from comment. <laughs> but they were such an influence. I uh, started to perform at about the age of six or seven by stealing routines from Al Jolson Eddie Cantor, uh, I loved James Barton. Uh, I thought he was one of the greatest talents we ever had. And uh, so it goes. And my acting was based on imitating. These were, this is my first influence. My acting was based on imitating those actors. No method, no, I did go to some kind of elocution class, which helped with the speech a little bit. But no method, nothing, just instinct. And watching George Arliss on the screen uh, and uh, the Lunts in the theater 
and I tried to imitate these people, Houston, and so forth. A sad imitation, but this was the beginning. Now, later on, I was introduced to the method uh, as, uh, by the group theater, uh, which, to which I was, became an adjunct at one point and uh, actually did a play with them. But what happens is, uh, what happened is that the method took over acting in America, uh, led by Strasberg on the one hand, Stella Adler on the other. Kazan was just starting as a director and did apply the method. And the method, and then he dropped away from it. The method made motion picture acting better because it was a more natural style for the camera. Because in the 30s and before, you had Broadway stars coming in to particularly talking pictures and acting for the second balcony. And they didn't need it. They just needed that, that eye looking, that lens looking at you. And you had as good a motion picture career as the saying goes, if the lens loved you. This is, explains why some very good actors never made it in pictures and vice versa. You'd say, that bum, how do you get out of it? Uh, well, <laughs> the lens loved him or her. The greatest example in our present time is Marilyn Monroe. She's a perfect example of the lens, just put it on her and you had a picture. So uh, I don't know, have I answered your question? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. but, uh, Harold Clerman was also a major, uh, a very significant entity in the group theater, was he not? And the Karnofskys and the Adlers. I'm glad you asked me about Harold. I brought with me a quote of Harold's, if I can find it. Yeah. Harold Truman was, to me, <clears throat> the central figure of the American theater of his time. Also a notable critic. He was the critic for the New Republic. He was a man of extraordinary violent passions for the theater. Hitler was in power at that time. And Hitler was known as de Führer, the leader. The group theater people would call Harold de Fury. <laughs> because when he got revved up, he'd say, now we're going to talk about this play. And before you know it, he was screaming and shouting and ripping his coat off, throwing its subway tokens going all over the place. <laughs> Did I make my point? he would say. <laughs> now, it so happens, I'm so glad you asked me about Harold because I, I don't think we know enough about him. I happen to have made a note of something Harold wrote. And I'm going to read it to you. It's about the formation of the group theater, which was the greatest theater we've ever had. I was lucky enough to do a play with them, but this has nothing to do with that play. It has to do with Harold and the group and theater. And this goes for pictures too, this kind of aesthetic would be very welcome in pictures. He said of the group theater, it's one of the few which 
said at the beginning of its work, plays have a meaning, and you can substitute pictures. Plays have a meaning we fight for. We fight for the meaning of these plays because they are good for our life. They are good for lives of those who love us and those whom we love. Theater, and that goes for pictures, is the one clear, strong, definite form of the expression for us of the meaning of our life and also the life of our families, of our cities, of our states, of the United States, <laughs> the world. <laughs> That's so Harold <laughs> And Now you bring me to Charlie Chaplin and the great dictator. Yeah. And your relationship with Charlie Chaplin and the work that you did with Charlie Chaplin and your friendship uh, and the years that you knew Charlie Chaplin and his family. Well, I was, it was one of the strokes of luck. I, I'm an avid tennis player, which is not germane, except <clears throat> that I was uh, playing tennis one day at, at a friend's house, and there was a fellow there named Tim Durant who uh, was a great tennis player. And he was a guest that day with me, and we were playing doubles. So when it was over, uh, Tim and I got to talking, and he said, well, you know, um, would you like to play a tennis match next Saturday uh, that I, I have arranged at Charlie Chaplin's? I went, uh, I mean, Chaplin was a god to me, is a god. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I'd be honored. So I met him, and we drove up to Chaplin's house, and I was introduced to Chaplin. I was in total awe. I couldn't, I couldn't speak because I went back to my childhood when I sat in a high chair, if you all remember that, which has a tray, and Charlie was the height of his power and fame, and there was a little automatic Charlie Chaplin that walked with the cane and the derby and all that, and the baby in the high chair was kept quiet watching this thing. <laughs> and here I am, face to face with this fellow. I couldn't speak. I really, you won't believe that, of course. <laughs> 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 but the fact of the matter is, I was tongue-tied. So we went out on the court and we played. That was the first time. Tim then called me during the week and said, well, you, would you like to go up to Charlie's again and play? Uh, because he has, he has another, a, a chaplain was absolutely madder about tennis than I was. I mean, he, he, he would sit all day in his tennis clothes waiting to go out on the court. Couldn't wait to drop the pencil when he was writing the script, but out to the court. So, <clears throat> I said, oh, yes, I'd, I'd love to go up. So it went up. This time, I added a little courage to my oven. And I did speak to Charlie, and he was most gracious and asked what I did and so on and so forth. <coughs> when I said actor, I felt intimidated because he was <laughs> the greatest actor who ever lived, not in the world, ever. So. That was the second week. In the middle of the next week, his butler, Watson, who was the butler 
with wooden teeth. You know the thing the butler did it? That was the butler one. <laughs> Watson looked down on the chaplains because he had worked for a woman named Lady Mendel who gave, he thought, superior parties. Charlie knew all about this, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, uh, Charlie loved to have warm grapefruit in the morning in his bed or whether. And uh, Watson would bring him the warm grapefruit, put it down. Paces were already cut. And Charlie would wait for Watson to go and quickly eat the pieces. And then what he liked about the warm grapefruit, he'd take the grapefruit and <laughs> just absolutely. And story I'm telling you, Charlie told me. And he'd do that. Then he'd put the grapefruit down and he would reshape it in very chaplain-esque fashion. <laughs> <laughs> and sit and wait for Watson, who disapproved of the whole, to come in. And Watson would come in and he'd go, <coughs> Charlie. Take it and go. He knew there was something different about that grapefruit from the way he brought it in. Charlie delighted in that. So, uh, the way I got into all this aspect of it is that he asked me to come up, and Watson had called, you see. And up I came, and this time it was to play singles. So it was just Charlie and me, and with that, we got into conversations. And the years went on, and we got to be quite friendly. And eventually, would go out in his boat and all this kind of thing. And then one day, I had the greatest compliment ever paid me in the business, I think. Charlie said to me, uh, what are you up to? I said, well, I'm looking for a property to do. I have something in mind. Charlie said, uh, I'll do anything you want to do. We'll go half and let me know what it is. And uh, you can direct it and I'll write it and produce it. I couldn't believe it. So I told him what I wanted to do. It actually was called, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Charlie knew the property, but he didn't tell anybody anything about it. He, didn't, he just told me to get a price and not say who my partner was. And I did, and we bought it for a decent price in my name. And Charlie knew all about these dance marathons. We never made it because he was involved at that time in Verdu, Monsieur Verdu. And then when he finally got around ready to do They Shoot Horses, he was about to take his family, he did take his family to London to show them where he was raised and so forth. At which point the government cut him off and said he couldn't come back unless he passed <clears throat> a moral turpitude test. And he said he would never come back. And then he, he violated that when they gave him the honorary Oscar. But he never won an Oscar as an actor or a picture maker. He cast you as the choreographer in Limelight. And he Limelight. cast me as the choreographer in Limelight. Along with Buster Which Keaton. I think is a beautiful film, and they're going to show again in March. But uh, in response to your question, in all through this, I got to know Charlie, I think, as much as anyone could know a man, there was something very mysterious about him, because there was genius all over. And... He was inspirational. 
and the way he saw the business, the way he saw acting. Um, as a director, on Limelight, he was very uh, easygoing with Nigel Bruce. Nigel, who always said, don't call me niggle. Uh, <laughs> with <laughs> Nigel Bruce and myself, he was very easy with us and Buster Keaton. But for Sidney, his son, who was the romantic lead, and Claire Bloom, who was the lady, he was hell on wheels. They'd get into a scene, he'd practically get under the camera, and he'd be going from one side to the other side, man to woman, man to man. It wasn't easy because there's something mad would possess him. <coughs> Enviable, I envied it. And uh, it was an, an experience to watch the way he altered his approach. I don't know what to say about Charlie, except he was a genius. In my view, the greatest actor who ever lived. I'm telling you, you watch him closely, particularly in the all the two realers, the early days, whatever Stanislavski said, you will see him doing. There was no speech, but you would see in his eyes the way he would listen, the way he would relate to people was incredible. It was like dynamite shots. And there it was, because as you know, Stanislavski devised, if you will, or put together, or codified, which is the best word, codified all the things he thought good actors should do. He didn't create anything. He didn't create this, that, or the other thing. He said an actor should talk and listen to the other actor. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Mm. How few do. He said there should be adjustment. This is Stanislavski, but this he saw in other actors. And it's interesting who his models were. There was the great singer, Shalyapin, who had been a hobo with Gorky. And Shalyapin was so great an actor. I, I remember there was a story about him in playing Boris Gudunov. He was the great Boris Gudunov that as he saw the ghost of the man he killed, and he looked toward the wings, the audience would stand up to see the mm. other actor. There was no other actor. We had an American in this codification, Lorette Taylor. Mm whom Stanislavski saw and thought was one of the greatest actresses he ever saw. Duza. Read George Bernard Shaw about Duza. And by the way, read George Bernard Shaw about what you think theater should be. When he wrote what he thought, what, as a critic, what he thought theater should be. This is the standard we should all live by. I'm afraid it's not the case. Now, what about Orson Welles, your work with Orson Welles? Well, we were very young. <laughs> it was 1937. Orson had been on the WPA, had done wonderful work. He'd played the, what's known as the Black Macbeth, <coughs> And uh, I think I should tell you a story about the Black Macbeth. It, he did it with, in Harlem at the Lafayette Theater. And he had this wonderful black cast, and he set it in Haiti in uh, 1812. And uh, to Luce Lautrec, I no, no, it was in the wrong country. Um, who was the Haitian 
ruler at the time, uh, whose name escapes me, uh, about 1812, and there was the revolt of the uh, Haitians at that time. And he set the Macbeth into that, and it was brilliant and was the beginning of Orson's breakthrough. There was still Julius Caesar to come. But the story I always loved about that, Orson had cast in it two rival separate voodoo companies who hated each other and had different voodoo rhythms. And he had set two companies in that, in addition to the principal actors who were very good indeed. It was all black cast, beautiful. Turned, New York was astounded by this performance. The notices were great. With one exception, Percy Hammond of the New York Herald Tribune, <coughs> which was the rival paper. Well, we had three good morning papers, the Times, the Tribune, and the World it was gone. So Orson used these two voodoo companies in the production. John Houseman was Orson's partner, and a very important part in Orson's rise. Orson did his best work with John Houseman as his partner. And the day after the opening, it opened at night, it was now noon, Houseman went around to the Lafayette Theatre box office to check on the business. Were they selling seats? And as he was doing that, he heard boom, 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 cheek, 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 boom, 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 cheek, cheek, cheek. He said to the box officer, what is that? He says, well, it's coming from the basement. Boom, 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 cheek, cheek, cheek. So Houseman went around, went down to the basement. The two voodoo groups were sitting opposite each other. <coughs> going boom, 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 Percy Hammond, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> the only bad notice. Boom, 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 Percy Hammond, boom. <laughs> Percy Hammond died two days later. <laughs> so be careful whom you deal with. Well, you acted in, uh, in his, uh, Orson Welles' production of Julius Caesar yeah. and played the poet yeah. uh, memorably. Is that what Well, uh, John Houseman uh, was responsible for my joining the Mercury, which he had just, this was the formation of the Mercury. Uh, Houseman and Welles had a project on the Mercury, 891, and they left the WPA because they had a production of Mark Blitzstein's The Cradle Will Rock, which the government on opening night said, you cannot do it, it's too left wing. And I think maybe you know the story, because it's one of the great stories in the history of the American theater. I mean, it's unbelievable that it would ever happen today. But when they were told they couldn't go on and they had to set the whole production, I'll come to my performance later. When they had the whole production, they were told they couldn't open. So Orson and the cast, and a houseman went out on the sidewalk in front of the theater, which was the Maxine Elliott on 39th Street. And they stood there, but meanwhile, Houseman and Orson had decided they were going to do the show anyway, and not under the auspices of the WPA. So they had an associate there, 
a little wizard, Gene Rosenthal, who became the foremost lighting uh, expert of the theater at that time. She was a wonder. And they said, Jeannie, get a truck, find a piano, put a piano in the truck, and then drive around, see if you can find a theater that's empty. <laughs> she did. Now, they didn't have the phones you have today, and she had to have all these nickels, and she was putting them in the slot, and said, I, I haven't found anything yet. I haven't found it. And finally, she called. And she said, I've got a theater up at 59th Street and 7th Avenue. It's called The Venice. <laughs> OK, said Orson and Houseman, or Houseman was on the phone with her. I book that theater for tonight. And she did. And Orson and John Houseman said to the audience, which had gathered out on the sidewalk with them, the whole audience was out on the street. They said, follow us. <laughs> and they marched from 39th Street up to 59th, where the Venice was. That's a mile. Up Broadway. That's what was so exciting about those days, you see what I mean? <laughs> and they go into the theater. Meanwhile, equity had issued a dictum. They could not, do, could not go on stage to do this play. So they get to the theater, and automatically the actors all go and sit in the first row, like here. The piano is rolled out on the stage. One figure comes out, Mark Blitzstein. And the audience is sitting there. Then Mark hits the first chord, boom. And that wonderful opening song, I'm going home now, oh, wow. of the prostitute. And as he hit the chord, and started into the phrase, the musical phrase, the girl who played the prostitute, I didn't know her name, stood up and started to sing the song. And the entire cast then performed the whole show, he did the whole show, with a wonderful audience standing up and cheering it. As the, or, as the actors stood up in the first row and did the show. Orson, being no fool, thought this is the way to do the show. <laughs> I was all wrong. <laughs> so all that scenery out to Kane's warehouse. He then staged the show on a bare stage with people sitting in chairs, just as you are on a row, and they would step forward and do the scenes, then step back to the chairs. And that's the way it's been done ever since that night. Hmm. It was historic in the American theater. And Cradle is a wonderful, wonderful piece. So it's been done ever since, yeah. Uh, you were mentioning Julius Caesar. Well, through Houseman, I was introduced to Orson, and uh, he asked me to play the role of Sin of the Poet in Julius Caesar. And I was delighted. You also played other parts, voices, things. As a matter of fact, I had the opening line of the play because Orson rearranged the text so that the opening line was over Caesar was standing on the center of the stage, Joe Holland, with all his soldiers and principals, Cassius and so on and so forth, standing there with him because a voice is heard crying, Sheila. He looks, he says, who calls? 
Beware the eyes of March. That was me. <laughs> Off stage, where I'm very good. <laughs> and all that is played with Caesar trying to find what that voice is. So that Orson set the mood of that play, boom, like that. You had Caesar looking around and his, his associates. So I did that, and I think I played a carpenter on the street. You had to do that at those prices, you know. And then came Sin of the Poet. Now, the interesting thing about playing Sin of the Poet, which was not in the movie, it's very often left out of the play. I know you'll think I am big-headed and full myself, but it became the play of the show. And I'll tell you why. Orson had an idea that he would take part of Coriolanus and put it into this scene. And you would have <coughs> rhythms which uh, were worked out by Mark Lichtstein. Boom, 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 boom. Come kill, ho oh, slay, come kill, ho oh, slay. To show the mob rising up at the death of Caesar, the mob was now dangerous. They were going to kill. And he started it with taking these Coriolanus lines about killing and so on, and building up a whole sound pattern. And Blitzstein, uh, so uh, Orson started the staging by having the character of Sinner the Poet, whom I played. Now, if you know the play, there was Sinner the Conspirator, and it's the the fact, story-wise, that Sinner the poet is killed because the mob thinks his name is Sinner, he's got to die. The rehearsal started with Come Kill Ho Slay and Orson staging me coming up a ramp and then stopping because he was rearranging the sound and the beat and the so on. And I never rehearsed this scene. We just went boom, 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 boom. And uh, the sound, the rearrangement of lines, and he never could get the scene right. In the course of this, sitting in the first row of the theater at the Mercury, Orson began to discuss the scene of the poet. And he saw the poet with a kind of beret, and this kind of smock thing, flowing tie, very Parisian thing. And I've never got the two of us sitting right there in the first row. And I said, well, you know, Orson, I, I'm sorry to say I don't see it that way. Because there was something in this scene that I thought represented very much what was happening in the world. It didn't need anything Parisian. It needed me in a plain blue suit and a white shirt with a tie, a little poet who gets caught on the street. Now, I had a model. When I went to NYU, as I was describing to the fellow at NYU, there used to be, on Washington Square, New York, New York there used to be a poet named Maxwell Bodenheim, who was a great friend of Ben Hecht's. And for a quarter, he would write a poem for you 
in, on a yellow fool's cap sheet of paper. <coughs> he was a poor drunk, was eventually murdered. But Maxwell Bodenheim was a well-known poet in his time. As I said, Heck wrote a thing about him, and other people knew him from Chicago, and he'd wrote, written a novel and all that. And he used to sit on the square in Washington Square, drunk, no place to go, <coughs> and wait for you to come along and say, OK, here's a quarter, and he'd write the poem. And this man came into my scalp. I saw it as... Maxwell Bodenheim, that kind <coughs> of poet who what, was going along the street trying to sell his poems. Well, I never got to rehearse it before the first preview because Orson, finally, we had a discussion about it back and forth. And Austin said, OK, do it that way. All right. We had the first preview. The curtain came down at the end of the first preview. Mind you, this was a show that was to set New York on its ear. They'd never seen anything like it. But the first preview, the curtain came down. Not one member of the audience applauded. Utter silence. I had said to Orson, I'm not going on in that incident of the poet. He said, why not? I said, well, we've never rehearsed a scene. All we did was the start of the walk and then a lot of bum bums and so forth. He said, OK, that's the way you feel, OK. I'm telling you the truth, by the way. So now the curtain came down on the first performance, a preview. Boom. No applause, nothing. Orson standing in the center, the company strung out, waiting to take a bow. Curtain never went up for a bow. There was no applause. We had a fellow who worked for us in the publicity department, Hank Semba, little fellow, broad as an ox, strong but small. He comes running through the fire door up onto the stage. The company's all standing there, staring. And he comes up to Orson, who is six feet one or two, and he says to Orson, we didn't get a call. We didn't get a single call. And Orson goes and spits right in his eye. Hank Semba rears back, and he's going to throw a punch, which I think would have flattened Orson because this guy was strong. And Orson grabs him. He says, oh, oh, no, please, please, spit in my eye. Please spit in my eye. <laughs> and Hank Semba went spit right in his eye. That was the first performance of Julius Caesar. <laughs> well, he postponed, we postponed, the show was postponed. He threw out all the sound he had, he threw out all <coughs> the noise that he had, sound effects, everything. I mean, he, he simplified, he threw out all the Coriolanus stuff, went back to the simple play. And now we started to work on the scene. And as we worked on it, I thought, I didn't tell Olsen this. I took a lot of papers with printing on them and had them in my pocket. And I came up the ramp doing this soliloquy, which is only eight lines. He says he had the dream about Caesar. And then stopping, because I sense Orson had the mob slowly moving in on either side.
I remember Stanislavski saying, although it was curious, <laughs> if you eliminate one sense sometimes from a performance or a scene, it heightens the effect of that scene. I must have read it the night before because I removed the sense of hearing. And then I became aware that here were people moving slowly on me. And what I played was they recognized me as the poet. Mm. And they wanted my poem. So I took the poems out of my pocket, not having told anybody about it, and said, offered them for sale. When Orson saw me withdraw the poems, he immediately became activated. He said to the extras who were playing, take them from him, take them right from him, throw them in his face. Beat them with them, so on. Which they did. It's a wonderful piece of business. And I started to move around. Austin started to block the scene in a wonderful kind of circle. He had a great, great thing about staging. He was master at that. And he staged the scene in such a way. And it finally became the centerpiece of the show because they followed me around, and I kept insisting they, uh, they really wanted my poems, mm. didn't they? They wanted to kill me. And they do. They rush me down the ramp and destroy. And I added one line, one word at the end, because he said he was sin of the poet, and the one word was the poet, as you see him disappear into the mob. Um, the thing that motivated me in that scene, to where people still speak about it 70 years later or whatever, was the times that we lived in. One was able to relate to the time you were living in and to try to make the work the scene, apply to that time so that the audience would see reflected in themselves or the possibility of what could happen to them. Because this was Hitler, this was Mussolini, this is what was happening to people on the streets. Because your name is Rosenthal, you go. And his name was Sinner, it was the same name, you see. So it was it, that one was fortunate to be in this awful time, to give you a scenario, so to speak, a story for your scene. Now what about Alfred Hitchcock? How did you and Alfred Hitchcock find one another and start working together? Well, Hitch I uh, met through John Houseman. They were both under contract to David O. Selznick. And Hitch was doing this picture, Saboteur, and he asked uh, Houseman if he knew of a young actor. I was young once. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you this from the vantage point of a hundred, you know. So I said, uh, if he could, uh, knew of a young actor, who could play a saboteur. I was a natural. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, uh, an appointment was arranged with Mr. Hitchcock, whom I knew about, because Hitchcock had already scored a big hit in England with his pictures uh, that he'd made over there. And he was internationally known. And he came to America, and this was the beginning. He had made a picture called Suspicion before, and Rebecca. And this was his third picture. I'd never met a man like Hitchcock. 
first of all, he was close to 300 pounds. And he had a most majestic way about him. And uh, humor, rather wicked humor. And uh, it made you feel comfortable. The meeting, I remember, was at 8 o'clock in the morning at the St. Regis Hotel. You know, to get on a subway <laughs> at 7 to get up there was work. So I met Hitch, and the experience, I worked with him for years after that. I mean, we hit it off, and I was in another picture, suspicion for him. And then he made me an associate producer of his television show with Joan Harrison, who was this brilliant, wonderful lady who was the producer. And this went on for a long time, eight years or so. Uh, it's difficult to describe Hitch because he was so unique. But he had what the great directors had. In my fortunate experience and luck, Hitch, Charlie, of course, of all, Jean Renoir, Orson, each, the greatness of each, the skill was different with each, how they approached the material was different with each, but each had a story, not the script, who they were, what their story was that they brought to the script, mm. that they did with the actor. What was the story? So that with Chaplin, of course, it was the story of the immigrant. All those wonderful two real shorts that are masterpieces, he's always the immigrant. Always that fellow, the outsider, who comes to try to find his place. But he did it through different stories. Hitch was so much a representative of England. He, he was so English that his attitudes, everything, that he applied to the work were British, were English. thrust through the script. Uh, Renoir, well, he, Jean Renoir was the most humanistic of men. The humanity of the man was extraordinary. In one of his pictures, Rules of the Game, he had one of the greatest lines ever written. Unfortunately, everyone has his reasons. <laughs> I think that's so great. <laughs> and <coughs> Jean, if you look at Grand Illusion, which Orson once said, if a decree went forth that every picture should be destroyed, only Grand Illusion should be preserved. And I know what he meant, because you look at it and you wonder at the humanity that is coming off that screen. And that was Jean. That was Jean. As actors, how do you work with a man like that? You absorb him, not consciously. You just know him. You get to know him. You talk with him. You get up and you do a scene. And uh, there's something in the way he talks about the scene, how it should be. You're not talking method. You're not talking anything. You're talking humanity, and you begin to absorb something. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I get this. And plus the fact that it gives you an improvisational freedom, also, Jean did. <coughs> but it's their individual story. Orson brought theatricality in. He didn't have a story, as these other men had, of a human quality. He had a theatrical quality. He saw it in theater terms always. You look at Citizen Kane, look at the angles of the pictures. 
and even when he plays uh, uh, the old fat detective and so forth. Force of evil. Yeah, right. Touch of evil, all that. Touch of evil. You see, it's the the ethicality of it. You know, it is the people so much. That was his story. And he eventually, in the marvelous film called Chimes at Midnight, where he plays Falstaff, there was something in Falstaff that got a story out of Orson. And that picture's wonderful, and some people prefer it to Cain. Mm. And it's interesting about his playing that part. Because long before he played it, when we used to rehearse, one of Orson's, Orson's method of rehearsals was about maybe an hour of jokes. <coughs> Standing around, mocking other actors, mocking other directors, uh, doing funny things about them. And then he would imitate such and such an actor doing false staff. In the back of his mind, he was always aching to play it, and he did, finally, in Chimes at Midnight. But each of those persons had an individual story, and when people try to direct, and you say, well, there's nothing happening here, there was no story, there's nothing to tell. Well, you've done some wonderful directing and have directed some productions. The one that comes first to mind is the five-part series on Omnibus on CBS, I think it was 1950 or the early 50s, which had been written by James Agee, and uh, uh, who plays a part in it. But Stanley Kubrick was a second unit director for you. And didn't he direct a uh, uh, significant Yes, sequence? I was asked to direct uh, five, approximately half hours for Omnibus on Abraham Lincoln, written by a great writer, James Agee, who himself was most Lincoln-esque. He was born down there in the Kentucky-Tennessee border, and he himself was like Lincoln, uh, not in looks, but the, the way Jim just was. And uh, he wrote these five half hours on Omnibus. I don't know how many of you ever got to see them. Royal Dano played Lincoln, but as he, there were a couple of scenes where he was Abraham Lincoln with the beard. That was the opening, the opening which was the closing for that Lincoln. Because it was mostly about the Lincoln who was growing up, who was a teenager, who was out there and finally they worked their way, the family west and he ended up in Illinois. But initially, it was from Kentucky. They moved all over the West. You ask about Kubrick. Um, I uh, was the director and directed the first episode, which was mostly about the killing of Lincoln, his death. And above all, the major part of that was the funeral train, which went at eight miles an hour to the countryside and sped up at night, and how people stood watching this train go by. And we dramatized it. That was the first episode. Now the rest of the story was teenage Lincoln growing up, starting with the Sangamon River and how he came into the town of New Salem. It required some shots of Kentucky, of the cabin where Lincoln was born, 
and then uh, some people going by, and also one or two shots about when he was uh, just a kid, and his father left him and his sister to go east to find a mother, a wife, a mother for these kids and a wife for himself, and left these two kids in the wilderness alone. I don't know how many people know that about Lincoln. Uh, so in order to shoot, to go on shooting the story of Lincoln with Royal, you know, as a teenager and all this kind of thing, uh, Kubrick, uh, Richard de Rochemont, a superb producer, uh, had been very important in the March of Time with his brother Louis de Rochemont, uh, suggested he knew a young fellow about 21 who worked for Look Magazine and had made a picture called Of Love and Desire. <laughs> and uh, did I want to look at the picture? Maybe he could do the second unit, this kid. So I said, uh, well, yeah, I'll look at the picture. And arrives Stanley Kubrick with this picture he'd made called Of Love and Desire in blank verse. I looked at the picture. I thought the camera work was excellent, superb. The blank verse was terrible. <laughs> the picture was terrible. I, have un I understand that years later, Kubrick tried to disown it and have it bought up and destroyed. But he couldn't find all the copies, apparently. But I understand he tried to disown this picture. But when I saw it, it was sufficient unto the day thereof. He could disown it right then. But the camera work was so good, I said to De Rochemont, by all means, hire him. Because there were no scenes to play. It was just all this. So he did shoot the second unit stuff. And uh, he then came out to location. <laughs> and uh, he asked me, he said, can I stay and be of help? I said, no, thank you. <laughs> now, you cast two new actors at that time. Uh, you cast Joanna Woodward. Right. And you cast Jack Warden. Yeah. Uh, who uh, went on to have great careers. Right. Jack Warden played uh, Jack Armstrong, who had the famous wrestling bout with Lincoln and was superb. And Joanne was just a girl from Ridgewood, New Jersey. She had done some uh, live television. She Lot was Anne Rutledge, was that the character? But in, in the, the Lincoln films, she played Anne Rutledge. And it was her first work in front of a motion picture camera. But she, she had had done the live television, which, as you know, was done on Kinney and all that. Um, it's a beautiful piece. If you ever get to see it, I'm very proud of it. And it's very moving because Jim, Jim, uh, was given to the bottle every once in a while. And we'd find him sleeping somewhere. <laughs> but it never affected his writing, which was glorious. Well, I understand that being 100, your age, that you no longer have to pay dues to Screen Actors uh, and Guild. It's the best news I've had all day. Yeah. You're all going to starve, because I'm and, not paying you. And Dennis, I mean, the people from the Foundation gave me wonderful questions, but I understand that our audience uh, has been asked to uh, bring some questions uh, for you. I, I have a feeling that that would be uh, not inappropriate. 
Oh, so here, here they are, because we could go on forever. For instance, I just found out today that in the saboteur, when you have to fall off of the Statue of Liberty, that the way Hitchcock designed it, you had to flip over yourself. A back flip over the railing, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And then after that shot, he could cut into the best stuntman uh, in the world at that time doing the rest, but you had to make a total flip. Well, Hitchcock was a master storyteller, and he knew that for the base, for the value of the story, that when you saw this heavy go and fall, and then call, uh, connect in the crotch of the thumb and forefinger, that if he cut away to have me fall, not in the long shot, he did have to cut away for the long shot, but in the close shot, it, if he cut away, the audience would say, ah, a double did it. So he asked me if I would go backwards over this railing and fall only about three or four feet to a lot of mattresses which were built up to the 14-foot height. And there was a grip, I remember his name, Scotty, lying there, and as I went backwards and over, you know, when you're 26, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I went over, I rolled, and Scotty caught me from falling off the parapet, you see. Uh, one take. One take. Then he hitch cut back. He, he's just a master. I mean, he cut back to a long shot, and you saw this body going through the air, which was one take. It was a great stunt man called, um, oh God, isn't that awful? Uh, who the stunt the stuntmen's uh, union had the equivalent of an Emmy named after him, and uh, they discontinued that after a while. But for years, the, the stuntman's award was not so much an Emmy, but named after this stuntman. He went through the air in one take and caught in there, absolutely. I thought uh, I looked very good in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tony Brown, Brown uh, asks for you to share uh, with zero restraint the steam bath experience of 1973. What? <laughs> well, the question is, with zero restraint, uh, the audience wants to direct you. <laughs> the steam bath, that you had an experience when you directed Bruce J. Friedman's steam bath for a television theater Oh, uh, I, I was producer of the Hollywood Television Theater. Yes. And I uh, did, I produced steam bath. I had uh, Bert Brickerhoff directing it, except for the last scene. <laughs> he came to me the last day of shooting, it was night, he said, Norman, I have to make a plane. I mean, uh, so I said, I'll take over. <laughs> but it was very curious. I never had a director quit to have to make a plane <laughs> in the middle of shooting. Well. The last scene was very good, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> and then John Odom in the audience asks, in what ways do you think being an actor has kept you vital youthful, and generally awesome. <laughs> awesome Wells? Uh, 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 awesome awesome oh, Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> You're all stuck. <laughs> I thought it was the contrary. How living the life of an actor and director and producer, is that what he's saying, asking? 
Uh, there, this same question uh, it was prepared by our staff, <laughs> and just the privilege to play, to act, to perform, to participate uh, ha uh, is so beneficial, so uh, nutritious. So enervating and healthy. Enervating, did you say? Enervating. Oh, innovative. No, enervating. Isn't that a word? Enervating. Oh, it's not? Was that not a word? No, enervating is the opposite. Oh, oh, I, you know, well. That's I, what I am now. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Uh, the answer to your question, I didn't mean to mock it, all you fellow players. I see by the audience, after all you've been in the business some time. I've always been a firm believer that being an actor, and by the way, if you start out as an actor and eventually direct or produce, you're always an actor. You never change. You may be producing, you may be directing, you're an actor. And you see it that way. We're all fortunate in that acting, I've always believed, is really born in you. It's an instinct. You don't say, I will become an actor because it seems like an interesting profession. You have all joined this profession because it's in you. You, you had to. I know I'm right. Maybe somebody is going to question me here. I don't believe them. You all look as if you put in a long time in this business. It's because it's in you. It's an instinct. And that's why I've always been suspicious of schools, of teachers. I know that's open for debate, but I say it's in you and you find a way to make it happen, and you've done it. There's another question here which uh, it seems to uh, be relative to that. Were you hesitant to work as a full-time producer for Alfred Hitchcock when it meant less time to work as an actor? I think that you may have answered that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then you're working as an actor, and your work with Martin Scorsese, and your work with Peter Weir, and now who is this, uh, this director, your latest? Judd Apatow. Apatow, where you are improvising for the oh, very first great. time. I made up all the lines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Judd Apatow is wonderful. I just had the most wonderful time with him because you all would have it. I, I wish it to you all, because uh, the pictures, <laughs> I might as well advertise the pictures. Yes. <laughs> Trade wreck. Good name. And the point is, with a guy like Apatow, it's so modern, it's today. You see, if you come in to do a picture with Hitchcock, you're very aware of a formality, starting with the assistant director who's having to wear a suit or or a tie and jacket, you know. And I once came in <laughs> in a Ponzi colored suit. Hitch always liked me to dress formally and I'm tired there. And he looked at me and he said, uh, did you have someone knit that for you? <laughs> That's the last time I wore that suit. <laughs> Uh, there was a formality about it, the, as I say, the assistant director, sir, and all that kind of thing. With Apatow, and you better say the lines with Hitch, you know. With Apatow, it's all improvisation. And the freedom of that I had never experienced in my over 80 years in this business. Yes, I had when I was working with the group theater and I did a play with them called Quiet City, that Erwin Shaw wrote. 
Uh, we did improvisations. Kazan was directing, so he worked with improvisations. But improvisation as to writing the script, <laughs> this is something new. We just did it. It should be out soon. And he works. He gets, in this case, wonderful stand-up comics. They came from Second City. Oh, no, uh, Saturday Night Live. And uh, a fellow named Colin. Anyone know? Colin something, Saturday Night Live? Jost. Who? Jost. Who? Jost. 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 Colin Jost. We don't know. No, I didn't like. And the girl, the leading lady, was named uh, uh, Anne. Excuse me. I'm sorry about the names. But they wrote, they improvised. Uh, and you stand to the side while they're improvising, and then he asks you to step. Suddenly he'll say, Norman, you were in Paris with uh, Josephine Baker. <laughs> <laughs> so you take off. And you, particularly these Saturday Night Live people, I, something prompted me in something that Judd called out, and I said, well, yeah, ah, Babe Ruth. Oh, boy, I saw Babe Ruth. I said, you know, he had a big belly. That wasn't fat. That was all muscle. He could lift a bat over that. That's how the ball went over the fence. The Saturday night guy said, Babe Ruth. Ah. He was black. I said, what? And suddenly you're in the midst of this terrifying scene. <laughs> 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 which the actor had done to provoke me, which he succeeded in doing. <laughs> so uh, it, it's all wild. And he finally, I, I think you all love this, he finally says, uh, Norman, and I was improvising with another guy from Jamaica, and I couldn't understand what he said. <laughs> In the improvisation, he said, I'll be a, he was a rapper from Jamaica. I'll be there, what y'all do as you did to all of it. And I would say, yo, hmm. He said, now you two fellas, you're now going to walk from this wall to that wall and do your improvisation. I said, okay, what's the scene about? He said, it's not going to be in the picture. Just forget it. I mean, do it, but it's not going to be in the picture. I said, well, what, why are we doing this? <laughs> he said, it's the trailer. <laughs> the last question from our audience was, what's next? This is what's next. So usually on talk shows that I see on television, the audience gets a gift everybody in the audience, and you are our gift, our supreme <laughs> surprise. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you all.